about it to go with Miss Terry. Our uh, scripture lesson is taken from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 30. You can find that on page 33 of your hand Bible. Uh, excuse me, your pew Bible. And, uh, and that's there. Also, I want to point out to you that in our bulletins each week are a little insert called God's Story, Our Story. Uh, and we use this on our Wednesday night Bible study that we have at 6.30 right after Wednesday night supper. And uh, everyone is welcome to that. I just want to encourage you to come to that. There are also some daily readings. Uh, we don't read everything that uh, every scripture in the Bible as we're going through this uh, series together. But uh, you can cover a good bit of it uh, by using the daily readings there as well. All right, so today our uh, scripture is Genesis 32. Again, this is on page 20, uh, 33. Genesis 32, verses 22 uh, through end. Jacob wrestles with God. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be God. Well, we've come a, a little ways from the Garden of Eden, where we were a couple of weeks ago, uh, there with Adam and Eve, and last week, uh, Pastor uh, Joe Peabody brought us a message about Joseph, one of the uh, 11 sons that was talked about here. There's a 12th one that will come a little bit later, Benjamin. But uh, uh, this week, we're going to kind of backtrack a little bit. I'm going to talk with you about Joseph's daddy, uh, Jacob. Uh, Jacob had two sons. They were twins, twin boys. Jacob and Red. Uh, the name Esau actually means red. And I'm not being sacrilegious or non-respectful here. If I, if I talk, as I've talked to you a little bit about this family, you're going to find that red is actually a very appropriate name. For starters, he had red hair, we're told in the Bible. Uh, very ruddy co complexion. He was a man's man. Uh, and his dad's favorite, but Jacob uh, was fair-skinned and all, and he tend, he was more of a mama's boy, and tended to stick around uh, around his mom and them, but, uh, you know, J Jacob, Jacob loved, loved uh, I mean, Isaac loved Jacob as well. But uh, these two always seem to be at odds with each other. Now, I've known sets of twins who have loved each other. I mean, they... You know, I mean, the whole Patty Duke thing, right? You know, they look alike, they walk alike. You know, they're, they're just so much in, that's going back 55 years, Patty. <laughs> Good Lord. Anyway, and then I've known sets of twins that cannot stand to be in the same room with each other. It's amazing. There, was a, there were two sisters when I was going to college that, uh, that were like that. They were both of them very intelligent. They were both of them in the computer science program. Um, and separately, they were, they were quite attractive, but you put them in the same room, and it's like they both drank from the ugly glass, right? It was just awful the way they treat I hope, it's been 30 some years, I hope that they've been able to work things out, but they were, they were just like that all the time. And it was like this with Jacob and Red. Uh, they were at each other's throat even before they were born. Esau starts to be born first, and his hand go, and, and they put a little scarlet thread, a red thread, in his in his hand, and, and Jacob yanks it back in. I mean, they're struggling for the whole time. Uh, and, and, and 
Bless his heart. Anyways, Jacob is a little bit smarter than Red. And he, he tricks him out of his birthright. And then he tricks uh, Isaac into giving him the blessings that should have gone to Esau. Because it turns out es uh, Esau, Red, was born first. And so he should have gotten some extra blessings from his dad. But Jacob tricked him out of all that. And, and it finally, it reaches the head to the point where, where Red says, you know what? As soon as the old man dies, I'm going to kill him. I'm just going to flat out off him. And so sure enough, Isaac dies. And Jacob takes off. He takes off. He goes to his uncle's house. And while there, he marries not one, but two of his cousins. Now, if this sounds like your family, I want to apologize right now. <laughs> he, has, uh, he has several children by them and two other women that are involved. And, and he winds up uh, tricking his father-in-law, his father, daddy, uncle, kind of thing, and, and uh, out, of, out of property and cattle and, and money and all this other stuff. And so his father-in-law gets, gets ready to knock him off as well. And so Jacob takes off with a great entourage, all the cattle, all the sheep, all the possessions, everything he's ever had, all, all of this, his wives and their maidservants and the kids and the whole nine yards. Some of his kids actually would have been his second cousin. All right, there we go. Uh, so, so they take off, and he's in this place now. He had been in Canaan at his, at his uncle's house, but now he's back into the promised land, the land promised to Abraham, his grandfather. And waiting for him there is Red. Now, the last time he saw Red, so 20 years before, he knew what was going to happen. Red was going to try to kill him. So he sends a gift to Esau. He sends a gift to him with a messenger. And the messenger comes back and says, oh, Red says, thank you very much for the gift. And oh, by the way, he's on his way here with 400 men. Now, these aren't a bunch of fishing buddies. This is an army. And so Jacob begins looking at all the things he owns, all the things he has, all of his possessions and all, and he divvies them up into different sections and sends them on ahead. So if Esau's plan is to attack and to, and to, uh, and to pillage or do whatever he's going to do, it'll, it'll happen in increments, and maybe he won't lose so much. Finally, we're told he sends his wife and wives and his children, and then he sends all of his possessions. And here on the side of this river Jabbok, Jacob is alone. He doesn't have anything anymore. He doesn't have any possessions. He doesn't have anything. There's nothing to protect him in case he is attacked. And wouldn't you know it, he is attacked. We don't know who started him. We don't know where this man came from. If in fact it was a man, probably later on. Jacob begins to realize that this is God. That Jacob has been wrestling with all of the feelings that he has towards his brother, wrestling with what he is going to be doing, how is he going to protect himself, how can he get out of this place where he is in the middle between two groups of his family that want to kill him, and now he's wrestling with a man. There was a 16th century mystic by the name of St. John of the Cross who wrote a poem called, well, I think it's called Ascending the Mount, but we've come to know it as the dark night of the soul. You ever have one of those dark nights of the soul? There's a meme that I like. A meme is one of those little picture things like on Facebook. They usually have some pithy little saying that's in there. I love those. Some of them are quite funny. Some of them I can re actually repeat here in church. But there's one I, I particularly like. It says everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you're stupid and you make bad choices. Okay. 
Jacob and Esau have created this problem. They've created this problem. God didn't create this problem between them. They created it. Jacob is wrestling with that. I find that most of the problems that I have that keep me up at night or that I worry about, they're of my own making. I'm not going to try to pin that on God. I know that I'm the one that's created my own problems most of the time. Something I've said, something I didn't say, usually a succession of days and weeks and maybe even years of not doing something that needed attending to. You know what I'm talking about. And so here's, here's Joseph now, 20 some odd years after seeing his brother worried about the future. Who knows what's going to happen? And he begins wrestling. He begins wrestling with God. For some of us, it's not what we have brought on ourselves. Sometimes it's just life circumstances. It's a diagnosis that we didn't want. It's that everything that we do in our daily life involves some sort of physical or emotional pain. It may be a financial situation that's gone bad, but at some point in time we ask ourselves, why God? And we begin to wrestle with our faith. There's some very important things that I want to mention before I get too much further along in here. This struggle between Jacob and God, the writers of the story have placed some things in there in the Hebrew language that really emphasize how all of this is interrelated. In Hebrew, Jacob's name is Jacob. The place where they're at is the Yabak. And the word for wrestling is Habak. Through the use of these words, it sounds very, very similar. The struggle between, between God and Jacob, and Jacob and the place where he is at. It, it's a story about a struggle that we all of us have at some point in time. In fact, if somebody told you that all you need to do is get saved and then that's it, you're going to live happily ever after, they sold you a bill of goods, and by now you probably already know that. As Christians, we aren't promised uh, anything other than God's faithfulness. Amen? And so what happens sometimes is we wind up in situations where even people who have never darkened the door of a church, we find ourselves having to go through the exact same things. There is a huge difference, though. We have each other, and we have God. Something that's very important in this story, don't miss it. Two things. The first is that even though this man touches or strikes, same word in Hebrew, Jacob in the hip and dislocates his hip. Have you ever had a dislocated hip? Anybody's hip ever bothered them? I know y'all. Yes, I do know that. Yeah, Henrietta's back here. She's dancing on the inside, amen? Amen. All right, here we go. That's all. Then you know what that's like. And even though he is struck there and, and rendered, he's going to have a limp for the rest of his life. Jacob holds on all night. The future is uncertain. He doesn't know what to expect. He may lose absolutely everything he's ever had, but what does he do? He holds on. He holds on. He won't let go of this man, this angel of God, until he receives a blessing. He persists in his faith. Even when it doesn't look like things are going to work out, he has no idea how they're going to work out. 
worked out. And the story here is when we go through these dark times, when we go through these circumstances, we got to hold on. It's not about our faith. It's more about our just plain stubbornness. All right? My dad used to call me pig-headed. He was right. Sometimes you got to be more pig-headed and just hold on. Because every word in the Bible says that something better is coming. It happened to people that are in a lot worse situation than you. People that were in a much worse moral shape than you are. I remember reading through the Bible the first time going, my gosh, these people are horrible. And yet these are the people that God chooses and God interacts with. So we hold fast. How do we hold fast? What can we do? Even if you find yourself stumbling over the words, you can say a prayer. You can say the Lord's Prayer. Even if you are struggling on the inside and, and you don't think that anything is going to come of it, you just hold on. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a, a devotional routine or something. You hold on and you get through that. St. John of the Cross went through that. There are other stories, perhaps the most recent, most familiar one to us might be St. Teresa of Calcutta. We know her as Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, you said she struggled with her faith. She did it in her letters. It talks about the struggle that she had in, in her faith with God that went from 1948 to her death almost 50 years later. And it was broken up with some times of, of great release, but it was a struggle that she had. And she was a saint. So we should expect some difficulties when they happen. Don't be surprised. There was a period of my life when something happened that really forced me to take a look at the reality of the situation. It was a reality that I didn't want to have to face. And my first instinct was to get mad at God. Do you ever get mad at God? God's a big God. He's used to people being mad at him. And he's okay. You know what? He loves us anyway. But the mistake I made was I could not pray or did not pray on my own. I could pray with other people, but I would not pray on my own. It's not that I couldn't. I could obviously pray because I prayed with other people, but I couldn't and would not pray on my own. Friends, don't let that happen to you. Pray even and perhaps especially when you are angry with God. There's something else. I told you there was a second thing that was very important about this passage of Scripture. Jacob did not let go of the man all night long. He wrestled with him. He held on to him. He was hurt. 